food is almost around the corner. <laughs> at, the, at the end of the session, I'll have an invitation for you and tell you where to go, and so you can enjoy some, uh, some good food uh, before tonight's concert right back here at the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra. Some, some friends from the orchestra world and from the broadcast world on stage with me right now. Bob New, Vice President and General Manager of the Minnesota Orchestra. Brendan Neenhaus, the Executive Director of Spokane Symphony. Vern Windham of uh, KPBX, Spokane Public Radio. And Sarah Lutman of the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra. And we thought we'd, we know it's at the uh, end of the session. We know it's late in the afternoon. So we thought we'd mess with you just a little bit. We have New, Newhouse and Neenhaus. <laughs> and partway through our presentation, we're going to stand up and move chairs and just see if you can track that, OK? Uh, we wanted to close this session with uh, really talking about local successes, because we all live in very particular communities, each with its opportunities, each with its challenges. You heard from two of the biggest markets, the two biggest markets, uh, in the first part of our big show this afternoon, uh, New York and Los Angeles. Creativity, innovation, mutual benefit, they are not particular to New York and Los Angeles. They can happen anywhere. They do happen anywhere, as you know. But we wanted to tell some of those stories, to hopefully to spark your thinking as well, and when you take off from Minneapolis and St. Paul. And um, this is why we, I was at a conference a couple, three months ago, and I knew I was going to be doing this panel, and I started asking my colleagues in the radio world, I said, you know, where are there really uh, great relationships between orchestras and a local uh, radio station? And I was at this particular conference, and, they, and several people said, oh, Spokane. You should talk to Spokane. So I called up Bern Windham of uh, Spokane Public Radio. He gave me a little bit of it, and I said, stop right there. I actually don't want to hear more, because I want to be surprised in hearing how it works in Spokane with all of us. So I'll just turn to Vern and to Brenda. Um, and from your perspective, you know, what's working, how, who called whom first, what are the projects you share on, who, do you feel like you're really in it together? Take it away. Well, I'd like to start a little bit by talking about Spokane because it helps frame the nature of the collaboration. We are in the eastern side of Washington, but we are the largest city between Seattle and Minneapolis, Calgary and um, Salt Lake City. So we are a regional center, but we're isolated. The um, Spokane Symphony Orchestra is the largest performing arts organization, and um, many of our musicians, though, also play in other our um, arts organization, other cultural organizations, and Vern was our principal horn for many years. Also, the, that the staff at um, the, the radio station, a lot of them are musicians, so there's an interconnectedness that really has laid a solid foundation for collaboration. And we have, you know, we have a long history of collaborations around the concert series. Um, Vern regularly interviews our guest artists, um, the radio station records our concerts, we um, and then um, broadcast them immediately the next week on Monday. These are classical concerts. Vern's also personally taped some of our um, chamber soirees and, and broadcast them as well. But um, just recently, last year, we embarked on a new endeavor. And um, we, it started because we were looking at our 2010-11 season and looking for ways to um, broaden exposure but also to generate new revenue. And at a staff director's meeting, somebody said, well, maybe we can talk to the radio station and see if they might be able to help us with fundraising. Well, we knew that wasn't likely, but Eckhart Pryor, music director, and I set up a meeting to talk to Vern to begin looking at what we possibly could do together, and Symphony Week at Spokane Public Radio was the result of that. So, Vern, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, we have a sign mm -hmm. on our door. Uh, we're a radio station. We have pledge drives, but we have a sign that says no soliciting. <laughs> they were trying to solicit <laughs> us. didn't work. <laughs> But it did easily solicit uh, work to solicit us for what we need to do, which was stay, get closer to our community, always to be getting closer to our community, and at the same time create great programming. And that really, you know, we could just stop right there, and, and that's really what we, what we need to say. Because the, the thing that we talked about was how we could get the quantity of exposure, because that's the first problem. We all know the thing, you, you miss that 25 seconds on the radio, you've missed it, you never hear it again. So it was to get quantity of exposure that seemed really appropriate, and yet still, that was good programming. And it's really helpful that it is that we are 
insulated and isolated and we know each other. I know all these people really well. So we started talking about ways that we could get both performance and serious discussion going in, the, in this one week, uh, just a week of uh, all, uh, all three hours of, of each morning, so the 15 hours of that week. And it was tied into the <laughs> opening week of the symphony season. Right, so that, that was at the end of the week. Mm. So we, we started brainstorming on things and, well, I'll, I'll start. The first thing that we all figured out was nice husband-wife teams that could come in for an interview so that we could get, we could get the sense of the music making, but also the sense of how these people in a place like Spokane, which is not a $60,000 a year orchestra for the, these people, the way these people make a living and how they create their musical mm -hmm. life. And so that, that alone was a really good one. And we'd also just done our first live recording and had a commercial release, so we had our operations director talk about the experience of the recording. And um, we, do you want to talk about that? We also had one of our musicians who um, regularly auditioned. And yeah. You want to talk about that? That was great. <laughs> yeah. we, well, uh, a really <laughs> cheeky trombone well, that, That's redundant. Yes. Cheeky <laughs> trombone player. Um, and he agreed to have a, a symphony audition live mm -hmm. on the air. Uh, that we sat there and we hollered, called out the excerpts and we told him how he wanted it different. And he had the guts to do this. He had just come back from coming in second in about three major jobs and, and he did it. And it was great radio. I understand. So he, you said, here are the, you're going to do what is the classic here, audition yeah, pieces? Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. And he okay. put this on the air live? Yeah, yeah it was yeah. just oh, that's yeah. cool. yeah. totally that's a live great. audition. Yeah. You know, here, 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 <laughs> here, here, here's the Mozart yeah. Requiem. Here's, here's this, here's that. No, we wanted it a little faster. And, uh, mm -hmm. and, and you were the ju you were the judge yeah, and me, some staff. Yeah. Me, me mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. and the operations yeah, manager, the symphony, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it was great radio, and that that, that was a fun one. Um, what and, else? And board members who talked about the pivotal experience for them when music really became an important part of their life, and there were some really powerful stories that mm -hmm. were shared. Yeah. And uh, we couldn't get, the, we didn't feel like getting the harp up the stairs, so we had uh, we had a recording, <laughs> husband and wife team, <laughs> we, a recording of the harpist mm -hmm. and violinist husband wife team come up. Uh, the last day, the symphony's guest artist uh, was stuck somewhere else mm -hmm. and couldn't get in town in time, so we called up the bassoon section, and the bassoon section just showed up and you know on about an hour or two notice, and and did a lovely lovely little set of bassoon duets, and and we chatted about things. And, and what ended up happening was. There was this great energy in the community. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and one of the things we tried to be sensitive to is that, you know, we wanted to be fair to all the arts organizations mm -hmm. in the community. So Vern has subsequently done similar things for Music Best Northwest and others. Well, I just mm -hmm. turned it into a month. Mm -hmm. yep. I made the whole month of <laughs> September be Arts mm -hmm. Preview mm -hmm. Month. Mm -hmm. So the symphony got one mm -hmm. week. And then, and, and then we, could, we could cover everybody else pretty decently with previews of what they were doing, too. Did either of your staffs or boards need convincing that this kind of relationship in general or this activity specifically is a good thing to do for your organization? No, we didn't. Uh, the radio station didn't for the simple reason, and you need to remember this, uh, mm -hmm. us, ra us little radio stations with these monoliths like uh, Minnesota Public Radio and American Public Media scare us to death that they and their satellites and their podcasts and everything are going to render us with no reason to exist. I'm exaggerating. And so that we're so aware that localism, that being the voice of the community is absolutely the only key and purpose we have in the future to exist. And so we didn't need any convincing. And it was more than just promotion for the orchestra. It really did help create a sense of the richness of the cultural sector in Spokane, which is really a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. Because I'm really careful mm -hmm. in all this stuff to not let the artist mm -hmm. be the promoter. Mm -hmm. And that's a thing, too, that I hope your radio station will understand. The artist needs to talk about the art, and the radio station needs to talk about the pr promotion enough that the purpose is the education and the art. The promotion is only the byproduct. And so that is one thing. If you walk into your radio station too aggressively going for the promotion, they might, sti they, they might stiff you. You have to remember it's about the education. It's about for the people that will never come hear the orchestra that still need to know what's going on and be satisfied with that, that moment of radio. Nine, nine out of ten times, I'd say, the, 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 the concert tape that we get from, from anywhere across America, it is from local radio stations who have a great relationship mm -hmm. with, their, 
with their public, uh, with their local orchestra. So we need that. We need that kind of healthy relationship so we can tell that story nationally. It's a win-win. And some of the successes that we have uh, are, are, are telling that story nationally, but also we started, as, as Bill Kling mentioned, right, you know, an hour or so ago, you know, as one little radio station in the cornfields of central Minnesota. Um, and, and it grew from there. And one of the first partnerships we created when, when the network was building was with the Minnesota Orchestra, the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra as well. Um, but uh, all along our, our history since the late 60s, these partnerships have been incredibly meaningful for us in terms of giving us great content, but also kind of helping us tell the story of Minnesota to itself. And um, Bob New is um, the general manager of the Minnesota Orchestra. We have um, a fabulous relationship with the orchestra, I think, um, in uh, the broadcast activity we do, and so I asked, wanted to have Bob come along and talk about it from his perspective, you know, what the value is in the different media activity mm -hmm. we've got. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can tell it from the radio side, but I thought he's, you know, really in your peer group. Sure. Yeah, thank you, Brian. Um, we have, as, as Brian said, a very, very long and very, very deep history with Minnesota Public Radio. Um, we routinely, on every Friday night of our subscription season, which is 24 weeks, um, each one of those Friday nights is broadcast live regionally, and those then eventually translate into national recordings, um, into symphony cast performance today. Um, we also, Brian has been extremely proactive, and I should say Brian is our producer, and he is on our on-air voice as well. So he's very much known to our public as, as the voice of the Minnesota Radio, our Minnesota Orchestra. And I think what's so important with that is that, Brian, how long have you, how long have you worked with us? It's been a long well, time. Well, it's been um, in kind of in two stints, but now yeah. last stint, uh, 11 years. Yeah, and so that continuity is so important. And you heard earlier from, from L.A., that kind of trust and continuity that that creates is amazing. Brian knows the orchestra as well as anybody. I mean, including, I would say, our music directors that he's, he's worked with. Um, he knows the people in the orchestra. Um, he knows the repertoire the orchestra plays. He's very much a part of our family. NPR is as well. Brian gets the season before it's announced. I mean, he gets a lot of confidential information, so he understands just the organization as a whole, so he can be a great voice. And as you also heard with L.A., we, we never ask Brian what he's going to talk about in advance, we wouldn't dream of that because he just um, understands us so well and is part of us. Um, and then because Brian is also kind of a media machine, he, his mind is always going and out of these regional broadcasts, he comes up with amazing ideas where we then end up finding ourselves broadcasting live from Lati, Finland and from Vienna and from the, the, the proms in London. And, and that's just, I mean, we couldn't possibly buy that. Now, we do sort of buy it, and I want to make sure that we talk a little bit about, um, you know, there are media requirements for our musicians who are, who are in unions. There's, there's a national electronic media agreement. We're very, very lucky in, in, uh, with the Minnesota Orchestra, too, that we have in our, um, in our own master agreement that our regional broadcasts, up to 30 a year, we don't pay anything for those at all. Those are something that our musicians give, and not every orchestra has that. We're really happy we have that. So our regional broadcasts come at exactly zero cost to us, which is pretty amazing. We work a little bit with NPR as far as um, they have underwriting for it, and our development departments work a little bit towards that goal. But uh, Brian comes in every Friday night, and it's just the most amazing publicity. Um, we also are very lucky because we have a very generous um, EMG built into our contract. EMG is Electronic Media Guarantee. Each week, a portion of each musician's salary is dedicated to electronic media, and that's money that we essentially, we, we pay out and we have to spend it. If we don't spend it, we don't get it back. So that is what helps our national broadcasts and our recordings. So it's a very nice position for us to be in because we don't have to be consistently looking for underwriting for that. So it's a unique situation, and we're very, help, very happy about it. But, um, yeah, the relationship with NPR is extraordinary, and we, I think, probably internally have worried a little bit that as NPR has... Um, 
grown as they become much more embraced into the world's orchestras that maybe we would sort of get left by the wayside a bit. That hasn't happened. I mean, they've been very faithful to us. At the same time, we've loved the kind of sense of not even competition, but camaraderie of being, you know, playing on the same program that features name any of the orchestras in the world. I mean, that's a really wonderful thing for us and the company we keep. Um, the trust that Brian and I have, I think, personally and professionally is enormous, as I said, and that so much counts for that because it's, we take it way too much for granted, I think, because Brian is just solid as a rock, and, and the NPR organization is such a well-oiled machine that anything that we do that's out of the ordinary or special or even the ordinary Fridays, there's always so much support around it as far as on-air announcements, reminding people to listen, and it's, it's just really an amazing relationship. And I don't want to make you all jealous, but it's, <laughs> it's really quite something. And, and it's, <clears throat> it's really not unique to this market. I mean, Spokane, there you go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And others as well. I mean, I imagine you would say this pretty much the same thing. Sure. Yeah, yeah because we're all in it together. Yeah. Uh, as, as long as, and we, Brenda and I were talking about this, as long as we're just honest and straight ahead with each other mm -hmm. and have worked out uh, so that we both can tell each other no and also. And respectful of each other's issues. <laughs> <Yeah>. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yep. And there have been times mm -hmm. when we mm -hmm. tell each other no. Mm -hmm. When Brian feels that there's mm -hmm. a particular concert for whatever reason that may not be good radio, fine. Or if we once in a while will say, let's not go any further with that particular mm -hmm. concert as far as nationals, it's just fine. Mm -hmm. And we've innovated a few times with digital product, uh, projects with uh, the Minnesota Orchestra. We tried um, a stream of uh, about 10 to 12 hours of, of great commercially available some of them um, from deep in the archive of recordings that the, the various music directors of the Minnesota Orchestra uh, made. We put that online stream on our, on our website last fall, ran it for a month or six weeks. And the thing I loved about it was that, you know, Bob and I kind of linked arms and he, uh, he reached out to the labels, some of which no longer exist. Uh, and made best faith efforts to say, we'd like to do this. We think we might get new audience by drawing in, some, creating some kind of digital project. And we ran it for six weeks, figured out how, many, how much audience we could get for it, and then we took it down. We may do it again, may not. But it was a, a spirit of entrepreneurialism between mm -hmm. the shops. Right. You know, it's like, let's try this. You know, we've got, an, we've got an industry that needs innovation and needs fresh thinking. Let's give this a go. Um, it, the... Uh, the orchestra broadcasts, even though most of my work right now is in, is in, in uh, management, still are and will always be, I think, just the, a joy of, the, of my life. Um, I never, never get tired of this. On Friday night last week, um, Osmo Venska, the music director of the orchestra, led a program of Aaron J. Kernis, Beethoven Third Piano Concerto, and then um, the uh, Sibelius Second Symphony. Yeah, it's the program I heard Tuesday night. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, yeah, that's right. That's right. I forget that. Yeah, yeah. So, I don't know if uh, you had this experience, but I thought I saw the sunrise coming up for the very first time when that Sibelius opens up in all that glory at the end of it. It was so moving and so wonderful, and that's the power that I get to experience on Friday night and live, and why that I just love that relationship and love the, what it is we do. We have an equally powerful relationship with the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra. Witness um, coming up this Saturday night. My colleague Allison Young will be in a broadcast booth behind you as the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra is on the air, uh, on stage and on the air. And Sarah, um, uh, it's, it's been a wonderful relationship and continues to grow. And there's one thing that I think that uh, in addition to the regular activity we do, we have a very special relationship that the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra has been able to carve out internationally with, through the European Broadcasting Union. And can you just kind of give us the sense of the regular activity and how that works in terms of media? It's so fun to have Brian call it regular because what we take for granted here in Minnesota as regular is a coveted partnership that I'm sure all of you would would love to have and it's just the course of business because we've been working together for so long in fact um, we're in the process right now of digitizing some of our old reel-to-reel -reel tape and we have tape with NPR going all the way back to the late 60s and it's just really really fun to be uh, working on making those listenable again as the tape is quite fragile and um, 
and now it will be not fragile anymore. Um, the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra musicians approved extremely broad um, broadcast rights in part out of ownership and trust that they have in the use that NPR makes of the material. And unlike the Minnesota Orchestra, we don't do a lot of live broadcasting, usually four or five per year. So Saturday night will be special for us. But um, we have a listening committee and they listen to uh, every concert. By the way, NPR provides the recording of all of our concerts, usually two concerts per week for our 40-week season. And of course, this is done without any um, charge to us. It's a true partnership. Um, the, once the listening committee has <clears throat> approved material, some of the uses they uh, can approve it for are unlimited use. And in that instance, material, I think it's up to 16 concerts per year, can be distributed internationally. And we like to package those up in, in bulk with all the program notes and the ancillary material that we've produced, some of which may be digital, some which may be PDF files of print materials, and send that over to our colleagues. We call it the European Broadcasting Union, but it's really 80 member nations around the world, including NHK in Japan and other Asian broadcasters. So getting that kind of exposure growing out of our local broadcast relationship that's just literally four blocks from here is uh, really something we're very proud of and excited by. Some other interesting things about our relationship with NPR, the program St. Paul Sunday was actually born of collaboration between our institutions because Bill McLaughlin used to be the assistant conductor of the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra and the beautiful Studio M, a fantastic recording studio which all of us would have trouble duplicating today because of cost, was built to house the size of the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra. And the early shows of St. Paul Sunday often featured our musicians and our entire orchestra. So if you go back online and look at some of those concerts, you'll find many SPCO musicians were featured before that show diversified and started having other artists internationally. Um, NPR is a also done a couple of very special things for us. Um, Bill mentioned one in his remarks when he received the gold baton. About 15 years ago, the orchestra was facing a um, difficult financial climate. We don't know anything about that today, of course. <laughs> that hasn't happened in a long time. Um, and it's generally not possible for a radio station, a public radio station, to uh, fundraise on the air for anyone but itself. Um, it's a FCC regulation. And uh, NPR applied for a petition. They petitioned the FCC and gained permission to have an all-day fund drive on behalf of the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra. And they put a lot of effort into the production of historic and contemporary features about the orchestra, reminding people of why we are important to our community and broadcasting this to the four corners of Minnesota, which, Bob, neither of us have mentioned yet. I mean, you can hear this in the Boundary Waters. You can hear this in, down in Iowa. I mean, the coverage is completely pervasive. So if, for example, Saturday I were to be driving up to northern Minnesota during the broadcast, I can just listen to successive stations no matter where I go in Minnesota. So they went on air. Um, and raised seven hundred thousand uh, dollars, and we were able to uh, use that to our advantage to keep going. And it was a really amazing day of radio. I didn't work at the SPCO at the time, but you were out there as a listener, just cheering for the whole thing to work. And it was a really, really great day. That's what? why. That's why I, I loved your story in Spokane because I mean we had to basically appeal to the Pope to get you know dispensation <laughs> to do that. <laughs> And I think it was a one-time only, and they it say, was. don't ask again, mm -hmm. because this, you know, this really is FCC law. Can't do it. Forget it. Get, if you want to do it, that's going to be a long time. So I love the idea of how you constructed uh, a, a week-long a week uh, relationship, a radio relationship that helped out the orchestra. Yeah, because uh, mostly by making sure that it was always going to be good radio. Like you said, it was, it was really great that in the one-day thing, you can get everybody to cheer for it because that's a neat thing. But we just tried to 
have enough interesting things, enough diff interesting topics. And, and we were clever. We did do giveaways, and some of the giveaways were tickets to our gala, so we got mm -hmm. to promote the gala in a nice, quiet way. So, mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good old giveaways. <laughs> yes. One thing Bob and I haven't mentioned, and neither has Brian, is NPR has another channel, which is all news. And one of the really great things about the classical producers is they're quite aggressive about getting news stories about us that they've come out of concerts or interviews that are interesting. They'll just walk them to the other floor of the building and say, hey, this is newsworthy or you really ought to cover this. So it really helps our coverage as well, all of the, those of us who um, have strong partners on the classical side. And I would say NPR News covers almost everything of newsworthy, every press release, every everything yeah. that we well, and, put and, out. And, and we <laughs> should mention too, what I'm always impressed with, with with NPR, again, a very monolithic sort of organization. It's not just, you know, two of the larger organizations in the Twin yeah. Cities, but, but just all kinds, you know, this is a big theater town, so they're always covering the small theaters and the large theaters and, you know, the choruses in town and youth orchestras. I mean, they're, they're just extraordinarily generous and civic-minded that way. Um, and they wouldn't have to be that way, but they really, they're really kind of amazing that way. And I can't stress enough, again, as Sarah touched on, you sense that it's through the whole organization, that it's just kind of an ethos there that makes it a very um, organized place and a very well-run place, which is just so refreshing. One thing they're doing this year, we're just going to keep talking about you, Brian. Um, we heard Contus, we heard Contus at breakfast this morning, and Contus are artists in residence at NPR this year, and that would be another model of something an orchestra could do with a local station where they're being featured in special programming, they're um, being presented in local communities where NPR has stations, and it's a new thing you're doing with music that's really, really neat. And I wish, it's, it's funny, I mean, to hear, hear the word monolithic attached to Minnesota Public. You know, it's a, it's a place that I go to work at and still feel lucky to go to work at. And every day is a dash. And I can't tell you how unlike a monolithic structure it feels. It's like, who's doing this today? Okay, let's go. And I just have an idea that, you know, it's not a battleship. It's more like a fleet of PT boats. We're just scurrying, trying to get as much good stuff done as possible. And we have fabulous partners here nationally and locally to make it all happen. Um, so I just want to wrap up with a final call. I see way too many of my business cards still in the box. <laughs> and I really do want to underscore that even though we are a monolith, um, we, we feel that we are... Um, we. We need to be in partnership with you. We have shows that are hungry to tell your story, to hear your great performances, your great recordings sent to us. If you need help with that, we've got resources to supply you and would be thrilled to do so. Um, and just know that you've got a very eager partner with us. And my colleagues, uh, Graham Parker of WQXR, he's, he's doing the very same activity in New York. He also can be a resource, uh, others as well. Um, so thanks very much for your time, your attention, your fighting the good fight. Um, as I mentioned, the, the, uh, the thrill is always there when I'm, when I'm there at Friday nights at Orchestra Hall, and I, I will be listening on Saturday night when the SPCO is playing on this stage. Um, and I'm just going to direct you for your next event, straight out the doors. Veer off to your left, look for a castle-like building. That is the old federal courthouse in uh, St. Paul. It's called the Landmark Center. Sarah has been cooking all day. Homemade hors d'oeuvres. Yep. The hors d'oeuvres are, are, are ready to go for you. Concert time back here is 7.30. And you're going to hear a wonderful, wonderful program. If you're still in town on Saturday night, join us on Minnesota Public Radio. Thank you very much. Have a great night.